If one of a hundred different insignificant events had transpired differently, if the group of seven friends who decided to go on a group holiday had picked Spain, or picked July, or picked another resort, if the McCann family had been given a different room, if they had brought a stroller along on their trip, if they hadn't dined at the resort's tapas bar, if a different person had gotten up from the table at a different time to check on the kids, perhaps only a handful of people would know the name Madeline McCann, and a teenage girl would be growing up in Leicester. Instead, the world is haunted by the face and the mystery of the most famous missing girl on earth, a girl named Maddie. While examining this story, I'll be doing an age-progressed sketch of what Madeline might look like as a teenager. Please note that, as usual, the sketch is not commissioned nor endorsed by those connected to or investigating the case. It is also not completed under ideal conditions. When looking at a child's face to do an age-progressed sketch, it's ideal to have pictures of their family members for comparative purposes, especially the missing person's parents at the age they were when the last picture of the missing child was taken and also pictures of the parents at the age that they would be today. This gives an artist some indication about certain genetic predispositions, how they might age, the possible effects of stress on their skin, and so forth. Failing that, it is possible to make do with pictures of family members as adults, keeping in mind the well-established and known general effects of aging on the human anatomy. For instance, The forehead of an infant will occupy roughly 50% of their face. As an adult, however, the forehead takes up roughly a third of a face with average proportions. There are, of course, exceptions. A person's eye shape will stay pretty much the same throughout their entire life. While a baby's eyes may appear rounder, this is partly an illusion. A baby's eyes will in fact look rounder because, as a baby, the iris will take up more of the space in the eye, making the eyes appear larger and therefore rounder. The iris takes up less space and becomes more balanced as we age. Other features, such as eyebrow shape, also stay the same throughout life. The proportions of the philtrum, the space between the upper lip and nose, also does not change. These are just a few of the very many elements that are considered when doing an age progression. The Algarve, Portugal's southernmost region, used to be compromised of fishing villages perched on the low cliffs overlooking white sandy beaches and bright blue waters. In the 1960s, the region started transforming, with resorts and villas cropping up to accommodate crowds of tourists attracted by the region's beauty and its mild climate. But where there was opportunity for legal business endeavours, so too were there opportunities for the more nefarious. Nick Davies, an award-winning investigative journalist, in 1993 described the Algarve as follows. When tourism opened the gate to the Algarve, crime slipped in behind it. The province now rivals Amsterdam as the drug gateway to Europe. Cocaine from the old Portuguese colonies in Central America Heroin from the Protectorate in Macau. Hashish from across the water in Morocco. There's a new boom in Euro scams, creaming off illicit fortunes from the £10 million a day which the EEC is pumping into Portugal. A cash business like tourism is ideal for money laundering, and the Algarve is awash with black money. There is still plenty of peace and sunshine, but it is Rivera style masking ghetto culture the Costa Chicago. Even the Sicilian Mafia have turned up. Available literature on drug trafficking syndicates suggests that in some cases they have similar infrastructures to human trafficking syndicates and may even be perpetrated by the same syndicates in certain cases. This is the setting for the events in the Maddie case. On the 28th of April 2007, British doctors Jerry and Kate McCann arrived in Praia de Luge in the Algarve region of Portugal, a popular vacation spot for British families. The McCanns were with their three children, three-year-old Madeline and her younger twin siblings. 
They checked into the Ocean Club and got settled into apartment 5A, a two-bedroom apartment at the very end of the apartment block, closest to the street. They were on a week-long group vacation with a few of their friends, mostly other doctors Jerry knew from work and their partners. This group would be nicknamed the Tapper Seven by the media. These couples also had young children. Of the other couples, the people closest to the McCanns were David and Fiona Payne. Matt and Rachel Oldfield were close friends with the Paynes too, but had only met the McCanns via the Paynes. The Oldfields and McCanns had only met once prior to the trip to Portugal. The four most important members from the Tapper Seven for purposes of the case are David Payne, Matt Oldfield, Russell O'Brien, and Jane Tanner. It was still low season before the influx of holidaymakers. The group could enjoy the amenities without feeling crowded. The first night, after everyone got settled, the group went to the resort restaurant. But they found the excursion complicated and inconvenient. The restaurant was too far away from the apartments and difficult to bring all the kids along. Kate and Jerry hadn't brought a stroller for the twins. So the group collectively decided that it would be more convenient to have their dinners at the Tapas Bar. The Tapas Bar was located under 100 meters away from the apartments. This would prove to be a very controversial decision. In the days that followed, the group developed a daily routine. Every morning, the kids would go to the daycare facilities where they were taken care of by nannies appointed by the Ocean Club, and they were kept busy until lunch when they would be brought back to their holiday apartments to spend lunchtime with their parents. After lunch and some quality time at the beach or pool, the kids went back to the daycare facility in the afternoon, and then after their afternoon activities, they would be brought back by their nannies to the tapas bar, where they would have their dinner. This would mark the end of the daily activities for the kids, and after dinner, they would go to bed. The kids were put to bed in their respective apartments. The adults would then go to the tapas bar for their dinner and drinks at around 8.30pm every night. The Ocean Club had a nanny service available at night from 7.30 till 11pm. But the group collectively decided not to make use of this because they said they felt it would be disruptive to the kids' sleeping schedules. Instead, they agreed to take turns every 30 minutes or so to check on the kids. David and Fiona Payne were the only parents who had brought a high-tech baby monitor to keep an eye on their kids. May the 3rd started like the previous few days. Madeline and the twins went off to daycare at 9am. At 12.30, the kids were collected by their parents and taken for lunch at apartment 5A. After lunch, the family all went to the resort swimming pool together. At 3 p.m., the kids went back to daycare. Jerry and Kate played tennis, and Kate went for a run. Then at 5 p.m., the children were brought to the tapas bar for their dinner. Katrina Baker, Madeline's nanny at the resort, dropped her off. She was the last person outside the group of parents to see Madeline. At 5.40, the family went back to apartment 5A. The kids had their baths, and then Jerry returned to the tennis court where he ran into David Payne. At 6.30, Jerry was still playing and asked David to go check if Kate needed any help getting the kids ready. The parents had planned for the kids to all jointly spend some time playing together in a recreational area before they were put to bed. David went to apartment 5A checked on Kate, and then returned to the tennis court. When asked later, Kate said he stayed for about 30 seconds and then returned to Jerry between 6.30 and 6.40. Jerry, on the other hand, said David had returned at 7pm. Kate made a decision not to go to the playdate because Maddie was very tired, so she stayed home with the kids in apartment 5A. Was Maddie, in fact, really tired? With no statements to directly contradict this claim, we have no reason to view this as inherently suspicious. 
Jerry returned to the apartment after tennis at around 7. At 7.15pm, the kids were put to bed, and after bedtime stories and songs, the kids were kissed goodnight at around 7.30pm. After that, Jerry took a bath, presumably to freshen up after playing tennis, and then Kate and Jerry got changed for dinner, opened a bottle of wine, and poured a few glasses before heading over to the tapas bar. They were the first of the group to arrive at 8.35. This point could be important to note, because if something had happened to Madeline in the apartment before her parents went to dinner, the aftermath would have been had to be sorted out quickly and seamlessly, so that the McCanns would be the first to arrive to dinner and be composed enough to continue as though nothing had happened. When the members of the Tapas 7 arrived, they ordered food and the checking of the kids began. Matthew Oldfield was the first to check at 8.55. To check on the McCann's kids, he simply stood next to the apartment 5A outside the kids' bedroom window and listened for any noise. All was quiet. At 5 past 9, it was Jerry's turn to check. He poked his head into his kids' bedroom and stated later that he saw all of them fast asleep in their respective separate beds. Madeline had her favourite stuffed toy, Cuddle Cat, next to her. Jerry used the toilets, and when he left the apartment at 10 past 9, he ran into Jeremy Wilkins, another tourist who he recognised from the tennis court in the small street outside. They then chatted for a few minutes. At 9.15, Jane Tanner checked on the kids. She said later that she walked past Jeremy and Jerry, but neither of them saw her. She didn't say anything to them. In a later reconstruction of this moment, she said if Jerry had made eye contact, she would have said something to him, because Kate had complained that he had been gone a while watching the football. She also said she saw a man carrying a child down the street away from where Madeline and the twins' bedroom was but she didn't think anything of it. This would become a very controversial moment in the case, and it's known as the Tanner sighting, or Tanner Man. Neither Jerry nor Jeremy saw the man. Pat Brown, a criminal profiler, has stated that she doesn't see how it's possible that neither man would have seen Jane nor the mysterious man. The Portuguese police had the same concerns. Another tourist later came forward and said it could have been him taking his child home from the night crash, and the pyjamas his child was wearing closely matched the description Jane gave. At 9.30, Russell O'Brien, Kate McCann and Matt Oldfield all rose from the table to conduct the next check. Matt Oldfield offered to take the next shift, so Kate sat back down. Matt Oldfield stated that he entered apartment 5A through the back sliding door, which was open. This door was closest to the tapas bar. The apartment's front door was on the other side of the building. Matt stood in the doorway, but he didn't enter the kid's bedroom. He didn't see Madeline because the view of her bed was obscured from where he was standing. He didn't hear anything, assumed the children were asleep and all was well, and he left. At 10pm, Kate went to conduct her check. She stated that she noticed that the kids' bedroom door was open more than they would have left it. When she went to close it a little more, the door blew shut in her face. She opened it to see the curtains fluttering in the wind. The window was open and Madeline was missing. Kate ran outside towards the tapas bar and apparently shouted, they have taken her, and we've let her down. The group started a search for her around the complex, and they called the police. The media reports that came out right after the press got hold of this story included supposed quotes from family and friends of the McCanns reporting that the shutters on the bedroom window had been jimmied open or broken. This appears to be what they were told the night of the 3rd when they were informed of Maddie's disappearance by Jerry and Kate. But when investigating, it seemed to the Portuguese police that this was not the case. 
the shutters were not broken. The only fingerprints found on the window were Kate's, which was not out of place since she had been staying there for a few days at that point. And the window was small, difficult to get through. All these factors combined made the Portuguese police suspicious of her parents. Another thing that raised suspicion was Jerry's original statement stating that when he went to check on the kids, he went the long way around to the front door of the apartment, which was locked, and that he had used his key to enter. He said he believed Kate went the same way when she went to check at 10pm. But Kate said she went in through the back sliding door. In the following statement, Jerry said he also went through the back sliding door. He also said that the front door was likely unlocked. Aside from questions arising from the change in statements, another obvious question is, why walk all the way around in the first place? This detail would only make sense if Jerry didn't know the sliding door was unlocked, and Kate did. If this was the case, it would be a simple enough miscommunication between parents to explain. The initial media statements made by the McCann's extended family in Leicester and the first statements to police would appear to indicate that they want to make it very clear that this had not been a case of children being left negligently in an unsafe environment, exposed for anyone to wander in off the streets and snatch the child. They admitted that while it is true that the McCann's dined away from the apartment, leaving their kids unattended 80 metres or so away, a detail for which they got a lot of criticism, they wanted people to know that they had not left their children unattended 80 metres away in an unlocked apartment. Now, we don't know and can't imagine their state of mind. They were almost certainly under a lot of stress, and we know they had consumed at least a little alcohol each. Perhaps they didn't want to believe that they had in fact left their children in an unlocked apartment. Maybe it was denial. Or maybe Kate did realise that fact, and that's why she shouted, we let her down. Of course, there is also the language barrier in translating these statements to consider. On the 7th of September, Jerry was given the status of Aguido and Kate of Aguida by Portuguese police. An Aguido is an interesting concept with no equivalent in US or British law. It is a unique status given to formal suspects under Portuguese law, including the legal systems of former Portuguese colonies. It is more serious than a person of interest. An arguido, in some respects, has more rights than a person of interest. For example, arguidos have the right not to answer questions posed by the police, whereas a person of interest has no such benefits. The first Arguido in this case was not one of the McCanns, but another man who lived in the vicinity of the Ocean Club and offered to assist with the case by providing translations from Portuguese to English and vice versa. Reports from members of the Tapa 7 saying that they had seen this man around the apartment on the night in question contributed to him being investigated. The suspicions around him, coupled with his Arguido status, was enough for the media who hounded him so relentlessly and made so many accusations that his life was turned upside down and his reputation left in tatters. In a subsequent libel lawsuit against numerous news publications, he won £600,000 in damages. Per Portuguese law, Arguidos can be forced to remain in a specific location by way of court order but the police allowed Jerry and Kate to return to Britain on the 9th of September. On the 20th of September, a man called Martin Smith called the police. He had previously made an official statement to police on the 26th of May, because the night of Madeline's disappearance at around 10pm, which was the time when Kate went to check on the kids, Martin and his family had seen a man carrying a small girl towards the beach just over 400 metres away from the Ocean Club, in a small street. This would come to be known as the Smith sighting. In his initial statement, Martin Smith said that the man looked like a local and that the child was held awkwardly, as though the man was not used to this position. On the 20th of September, 
after the McCann's Okwida status was confirmed, and 11 days after seeing news coverage of Jerry McCann carrying one of the twins, Martin said he was 60 to 80% sure the man he saw that night was Jerry. His wife felt the same way, but the others in his group who also saw the man did not agree with this. Given the media frenzy surrounding this case, it is difficult to imagine that Martin was not at all exposed or influenced by the news that the McCanns were considered formal suspects in this case. Two efforts were drawn up of the person the Smith family saw, and these efforts were later used by Scotland Yard, indicating that the Smith sighting is considered an important, reliable piece of evidence. The man could not possibly have been Jerry if the timeline is accurate. However, conflicting reports have blurred the lines of who was where at what time that night. Employees from the Ocean Club have allegedly stated that Jerry was gone for about 25 minutes. But Jeremy Wilkins can verify that he saw Jerry, and if Jerry was gone for 25 minutes, he would still have returned to the table well before 10pm. Russell O'Brien, Jane Tanner's partner, was gone for an hour. Allegedly his food had to be reheated when he returned. He reported that their baby was sick. If Russell's food was reheated, that means he would also have been back at the table before 10pm, because the dinner was abandoned after Madeline was discovered missing during Kate's check at 10. A private investigator from Boston claims that employees from the Tapper's restaurant who served the group that night told him that nobody left the table at all that evening. What had led up to the McCanns being made are guidos. Usable fingerprints were found on the patio door, but these were not matched to any known person. Hundreds of people were interviewed, and some witnesses reported unsavory characters hanging around outside the apartment building. A number of people reported seeing an ugly blonde man. There was also criticism of the way in which the Portuguese police were conducting their investigation. Some holidaymakers who were in the vicinity at the time of the abduction allegedly later contacted British police to say they had not been interviewed. The upstairs neighbour living above apartment 5A reported hearing Madeline crying for close to two hours one night a few days before she went missing. In her book, titled Madeline, Kate McCann also mentions that at breakfast one morning during this trip, Madeline asked why her parents didn't come when she and her brother had cried the night before. Kate stated that the question puzzled her, because she didn't know what period of time Madeline was referring to. According to police records, police tracked and made record of Jerry and Kate's phone records on the days after Madeline was reported missing. It was determined that their phones showed no antenna activity on the 4th of May at 4 15 and 6 a.m. and between 7.15 and 7.45 a.m. After the Portuguese police search operations with search teams and tracking dogs didn't result in any new leads, two important characters were brought in. Their names are Eddie and Keela. They are two Springer Spaniels who were flown into Praia de Luz from the UK. Keela is a blood-sniffing dog and Eddie is a cadaver dog. They were brought to apartment 5A, as well as to the beach, a nearby wasteland, and to the car the McCanns had hired three weeks after Madeline vanished. Keela the blood dog alerted behind the sofa, inside the trunk of the car, and to the key ring for the ignition key, which was in the map compartment in the driver's door. Eddie alerted to behind the sofa, inside the wardrobe in the main bedroom, to Cuddle Cat, even though it had been washed by Kate in the interim, and to some of Kate's clothes. He also alerted outside the driver's door of the car. When asked about this during the police interview, when he was made not Guido, Jerry McCann had no explanation for these alerts. The McCann's public relations representative, former BBC reporter Clarence Mitchell, later stated the alerts to Kate's clothing was due to her handling dead bodies in her role as a medical doctor. Kate was, at the time, working as a general practitioner. 
DNA samples were collected where the dogs alerted. The profile contained some matches to Madeline, but lab examination revealed it contained the profiles of at least three people, and the lab stated that the result is too complex for meaningful interpretation or inclusion. They said, We cannot answer the question, is the match genuine or is it a chance match? In a case as complicated as this, and with the victim being a young child, emotions run high and objectivity becomes difficult if not impossible. You may even argue that pure objectivity does not exist. Every statement, situation or image we perceive is already distorted as soon as we mentally process it. We each observe it through a lens which is tainted by our previous experiences, education, concepts of morality, personality, and many other factors. Part of the lens of an expert looking at a situation, or a criminal case, is their education and experience which increases the validity and reliability of their opinions. However, they are still human, and they hold subjective views. To correct for this and to achieve objectivity as best we can, we make room for the devil's advocate. The role of devil's advocate was first established by the Roman Catholic Church in the 17th century to test the claims of those who were selected to be canonized as saints. As an intellectual exercise, this still has merit today. Examining other perspective is as essential to critical thinking as it is to developing empathy. While this might not be the most satisfying course of action, it is important to interrogate evidence properly, thoroughly, and holistically. Having said that, the dog evidence is very compelling, however, it may also be questioned. Mary Cabulk is a trainer of sniffer dogs such as blood and cadaver dogs, and also an evaluator of sniffer dogs and their handlers. She works in Nevada and California. According to her, cadaver dogs are trained in specific climates and specific levels of decomposition. In other words, a dog trained in a humid climate on fresh remains will not be as successful on human remains in a more advanced state of decomposition in an arid region. The question then arises, could the climate in the UK versus the Algarve have made any difference? Aside from this, the behavior of the handler is an essential component in the success of the dogs. Eddie had made mistakes before, including mistakenly alerting to a piece of coconut shell. But Eddie had also had many successes in the past, which cannot be discounted. The lead investigator from the Portuguese police, Amaral, stated that a woman had approached the police to make a report about the McCann's rental car. She lived next door to where the McCann's were staying and said she had noted that the car trunk had been left open day and night for several days. Police documents include interviews with various McCann family members who explained that household trash had been transported in the car and that juice from shrimp and seafood that had been purchased leaked into the car and created an unpleasant odour. At the point when the McCanns were made aguidos, tensions between the McCanns and the Portuguese police had reached boiling point. The police were frustrated by the media circus, partly spurred on by public relations officials sent by the British government and also retained by the McCanns. Police didn't understand why the McCanns were giving out information that they had advised them to keep quiet, like the discoloration in Maddie's eye. The Tapas 7 declined to participate in a reconstruction of the evening in question, and Kate refused to answer all but one of the questions posed to her during their interrogation of her. The police thought it strange that the twins had not woken up and speculated that the kids might have been drugged. The police files state that Kate approached them three months after Madeline disappeared and asked them to order tests of hair samples, blood samples and fingernail samples from the twins, but that they had not done so. Tests later commissioned by the McCanns did not show the presence of any drugs. According to Cansford Laboratories, a laboratory that conducts these types of tests, Drugs would show up in hair samples for six months, and in some cases, even up to 12 months. The insinuation the police were building to was that Madeline had died in apartment 5A. 
possibly by accident, and that her parents had covered it up and disposed of her body. The suggestion was made that there was perhaps an accidental overdose of Calpol, paracetamol for kids. Paracetamol, however, does not have any sedative effects, and a death due to paracetamol overdose is usually a slow and painful death over multiple days due to multiple organ failure. Despite the anger about talking to the press, Chief Inspector Gonzalo Amaral was removed from his post shortly after stating to the media that the British police had only pursued leads helpful to the McCanns. Amaral later also claimed that MI5 spies and Gordon Brown organised a cover-up and assisted in hiding Madeline's body. To try and understand Amaral, it's important to examine his professional history and the history of missing children in the Algarve. Before Madeline, there was Joanna. Joanna Cipriano was only eight years old when she vanished in 2004. Her mother reported her missing. Amaral was in charge of the investigation. Her mother was interrogated and confessed to killing Joanna because Joanna witnessed an incestuous relationship between her mother and her uncle. Joanna's mother withdrew her confession immediately afterwards. She was covered in bruises and stated that the police had beaten the confession out of her. The police, however, claimed that she threw herself down the stairs, possibly in an attempt to commit suicide. She was convicted and still proclaims her innocence to this day. Amaral was convicted of falsifying documents in the Joanna Cipriano case. He received an 18-month suspended sentence. Before Joanna, there was René. René Hassi, a six-year-old German boy on vacation with his parents, vanished 25 miles from Praia de Luz in 1996. His mother and her partner had taken him to the beach at 6 p.m., and she said René was around 30 metres in front of her when suddenly he disappeared as if he had been swallowed by the earth. She immediately notified the local police, who she claimed at the time were not very interested and did not bother to search for René, telling her that he had probably drowned. Despite the police reporting that they conducted an extensive search for the boy, records reveal that his name is not even registered on the police's computer database of missing people, and also not found in their paper entries. And before René, there was Rachel. Rachel Charles was a nine-year-old British girl who went missing in the Algarve in 1990 and was found murdered. When Rachel was murdered, a man was arrested, a British man who lived in the area, but it is widely believed that her stepfather was involved and that he died, having never been charged partly because it is believed that the police didn't do their due diligence in this case. A valid question then is whether this incident and the criticism that followed created a specific lens for the police in the region to view and approach future child abductions. On 21 July 2008, the case was shelved by the Portuguese police and the Arguido status was lifted from all three Arguidos due to lack of evidence. That same year, Amaral published a book where he outlined his theory of the McCann's guilt. He claimed that they had faked an abduction and hidden Madeline's body. They sued him, ultimately unsuccessfully, after a number of appeals, for defamation. Madeline's fund covered the legal fees. Madeline's fund was set up to raise funds for her search from individuals, companies and so forth. According to the BBC, it raised almost £2 million in the first 10 months after the disappearance, and that there was controversy in October 2007 when it emerged that the McCanns had used money from this fund to pay two mortgage payments on their home. The fund has paid for, among other things, lawyers, auditors, PR representatives, awareness campaigns, and for private investigators. In May of 2011, Scotland Yard reopened the case, nicknamed Operation Grange. To their credit, they did a lot of work on this case. They released an age-progressed sketch, and they investigated over 8,000 sightings and took over 1,300 statements. But eventually, the investigation was scaled back in 2015. Today, it remains active, 
but with fewer resources and fewer people working on it. A DNA analysis expert in the US has offered to test the DNA samples again using updated technology. Scotland Yard has, however, not accepted this offer. At face value, this seems perplexing and may have fueled many conspiracy theories about a cover-up. To interrogate this, we must once again employ the perspective of the devil's advocate. The DNA program in question is called True Allel. It has been used successfully in court cases in the United States, but it is not without controversy. Some programs like True Allel are proprietary. This means that anyone but the patent owner cannot have access to the code to learn how the program makes certain determinations, so they cannot challenge or verify these determinations. In a court system, this has created what has been described by some as a new black box, where courts and juries are forced to trust that the program does not contain any errors or flawed assumptions. And this can possibly be viewed as problematic, including by those involved in Operation Grange. In 2020, the German police became publicly involved in the case, though they had been conducting an investigation behind the scenes for some time, at least two years. They publicly stated their belief that they knew who had taken Madeleine. The suspect was already in prison for another crime. He had spent a significant amount of time in the Algarve and was a documented sex offender, including sex offences committed against children. Let's take a closer look at who this individual is. In 1976, Christian Bruckner was born in Würzburg under a different name, believed to be Fischer. He was adopted by the Bruckner family and took their surname. In 1994, he was given a two-year sentence for abusing a child and performing sex acts in front of a child. In 1995, he first arrived in Portugal as an 18-year-old backpacker, and he began to work in catering in the seaside resorts of Lagos and Praia de Luz. But friends say he became involved with a criminal syndicate, mostly trafficking drugs into the Algarve. In September of 2005, he put on a mask and he broke into an apartment where a 72-year-old American tourist was staying. The victim was bound, gagged, blindfolded, and whipped with a metal cane before being raped. She said afterwards that he clearly enjoyed torturing her before the rape. In April of 2007, he moved out of the farmhouse and into a camper van, which was linked to the crime. The farmhouse was cleaned and a bag of wigs was found. On May the 3rd, 2007, when Maddie went missing, Berkner's mobile phone placed him in the direct vicinity of the apartment that night. He then returned to Germany shortly after that. In 2016, he was given a 15-month sentence for sexual abuse of a child in the act of creating and possessing child pornographic material. On May the 3rd of 2017, Bruckner was said to be in a bar with a friend when a 10-year anniversary appeal following Madeleine's disappearance was shown on German television. He was said to have told his friend in the bar that he knew all about what happened to Madeline. He then showed his friend a video of him raping a woman. The friend went to the police shortly afterwards. In June of 2017, he went back to Portugal, but was then extradited again to Germany. In August of 2018, he was released from prison, and he lived for some time on the streets, but he was then again later jailed for drug offences. In 2020, prosecutors said they had evidence that he had killed Maddie. They informed the McCanns, but they have not revealed all the evidence they have yet as the investigation is still open. They found internet posts on forums allegedly made by the suspect discussing how badly he wanted to abuse a little girl. Investigators searched an abandoned factory once owned by the suspect and found USB drives buried under a dead dog. On the USBs, they found thousands of pictures of child abuse. The prosecutors declined to comment on whether there were pictures of Madeline among these images. The open question is why prosecutors seem so confident of his guilt, 
and yet they have not charged him with a crime. In 2019, Amaral made a statement that the British police had found a scapegoat, a German sex offender currently in prison for unrelated crimes. He also claimed that the Portuguese police had investigated this man and cleared him, because according to Amaral, his lifestyle prior to the disappearance indicated that he was not involved. However, out of all of the available files and documents made public in this case, and there are many, I was unable to find any reference of this investigation or this clearance, despite the mention and description of many other suspects and sex offenders who were investigated in this case. Now, let's talk about the McCanns. Go to any comment section on any video, post or article about them, and you'll likely find scores of people publicly airing their dislike of the couple. It has been said that they are too cold, too arrogant, too coached. Based on the commentary on social media, many people seem to feel that their actions of leaving the kids in the apartment while they ate at the tapas bar was unforgivably negligent. It is possible that they have made that negative public perception worse by never showing any acknowledgement that they may have made a mistake. Instead, they have responded in ways which may be interpreted as doubling down or becoming defensive. But does being unlikable make them guilty of murder or culpable homicide? A number of experts have done analyses of the body language of the parents in interviews, and it may not be what you expect. Tell us how you discovered that Madeline had gone. Um, as I think people are aware, um, we were checking regularly on the children. And um, it was during my, one of my checks that I discovered she'd gone. I, mean, I can't really go into any details about that, but I'm sure any parent will realise how that felt. Did the panic set in immediately? Yeah, pretty much. This is a resort that offers childcare facilities, babysitting facilities. Why then were the three young children left alone in the apartment while you were having a meal? I mean, I think if you know the location here, which you've seen, uh, what we did, uh, I think, and it, we've been reassured by the fact in the thousands of messages from people who have either done exactly the same or said they would have done the same. And for us, it really wasn't very much different to having dinner in your garden and the proximity of the location. I think it's fair to say that, you know, the guilt that we feel having not been there at that moment, irrespective of whether we had been in the other bedroom or not, will never leave us. At the beginning, Kate hears Jerry uh, start to answer. She opens her mouth to answer, shuts her mouth and then kind of looks away. I think there's some shame here. I think that that could be an indication. Jerry answers immediately with an eyebrow flash, which is very genuine. Uh, unrehearsed eyebrow flash, which is uh, what, you know, primates and humans, we all squeeze our eyebrows down and together when we're, we're PO'd, we're, we're mad at somebody. And the eyebrow flash is something we do to indicate innocence. It's the opposite of anger to other primates. By the way, his chin is up. We know that when people confess to crimes, their chin goes down, they protect their throat. A person who's guilty covers their throat. A person who's guilty breaks eye contact and changes words. It's easy to mistake that any normal person would have done this as blame sharing. I don't think that's the case here. I think they're simply saying, look, we could see the door from where we were and we thought, okay, this is okay. They certainly feel some guilt because, yeah, they were checking on them every 30 minutes. They knew it. there's a risk of some kind. And it makes people really doubt them because of that. So most people are under the impression that breaking eye, eye contact means you're lying. So will you go into a little bit of detail about that? When I ask you a question that requires you to think and your eyes break contact, it doesn't mean you're lying. It means I'm forcing you to think. If your mother's 90 and I say, what color is your mother's hair? And you say gray, that doesn't take thought. So the question needs to ask something that creates thought. We could probably say stairwell to heaven. What's the ninth word? Everybody on earth has heard that song. If you play it through your head, you'll likely your eyes will drift slightly up and somewhere to your left. Most of us do about 10% will go the other place. So I want you to know that eye movement will probably do something on this at one point is normal for people who are thinking. When you get to these two lower levels, that's all internal conversation, whether it's emotional or navigating thought. The myth that people look away when they're lying, where people say, look me in the, look me in the eye, 
and and tell me tell me that again that myth is so pervasive that liars are more likely to make direct eye contact uh, when they're being deceptive the global obsession with the Madeleine McCann case can perhaps best be explained by the concept of the identifiable victim effect, which describes the likelihood that we feel greater empathy and an urge to help in situations where tragedies are about a specific identifiable individual compared to situations where the victims are a larger, vaguer group of people. The resources available to create the decade-long awareness campaign for Madeleine is a driving force for this. We feel involved and invested in this case and will continue to discuss, analyze and speculate when or if this case is definitively solved. At the end of the day, what really happened to Madeleine McCann remains, for now, a mystery.